Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter number 7. Now, after all the fun stuff, Isaiah 7, I stared at it quite a long time. That doesn't mean that, uh, well, well, there's one thing you need to remember all the time. The Bible says every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. Now, that means those unpronounceable names that I seem to get into the habit of getting into, uh, the, every one of those is there for a purpose, and you find lots of good things about uh, through those names, but that requires a great deal more study than just reading over it. But then you get chapter 7 of Isaiah, and it's a lot of different stuff. It's a lot of different facts, uh, but you have to put it all together. And let's read, if, we if you would. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that reason the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Rehomaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason, and within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. What you see in this chapter is some allies that are going up against Jerusalem. In all the history of, of Israel on that land, and whether they're on the land or not, it's always been a battleground. It's been a, a field of blood, hasn't it? But in all the Bible, you see Jerusalem always being attacked, and this chapter is no different. It's about people wanting to attack Jerusalem. Now, you can see that, especially when David's not in charge. When David was a king, not too many wanted to attack, and they didn't do it twice, did they? Well, here... You notice it says um, in verse 2, it was told the house of David saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved. The king's heart was moved. Why? Because these two, uh, Syria and, uh, and uh, uh, Remaliah, king of Israel, they were both, they had both attacked Jerusalem before and they failed in doing so. So he's pretty sure that if the two of them get together, it's going to be a different thing. So he's concerned about that. And remember this as well, the last chapter is all about, well, in verse 10 of chapter 6, make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy. It's talking about the rebellion against God. It's talking about how they won't listen to God. They won't listen to the prophets and they still seek to follow their, their, uh, uh, perverse religion, their their uh, all their idols and all that stuff. They're still doing that, and we know this that this king is a bad king. And so, if you're a bad king, you know you're. Uh, if you knew you were the king of Israel, I, I'm sorry, of Judah, the southern tribe, the kingdom that was uh, kept there because of David and uh, God's uh, uh, dealings with David. If you knew that and you were still worshiping idols and you were still far from where you should be and frankly you had no desire to leave the idol worship, then of course you're not going to have confidence in that day. You can't have confidence and that's the deal. They didn't have confidence in that day. Now I like to look at these things and look at the big picture and see, remembering that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it was written for our learning. It's all profitable for us. And this is directly after God commissions Isaiah in verse 9 of chapter 6. He said, go and tell this people. He is to go to his own people, and this is the very next thing that happens. Now, Israel was under Isaiah as a prophet, and I looked at the different uh, rough times, according to Usher, and Isaiah was a great king, and much of the last chapter was uh, uh, sorrow because Isaiah had died. Isaiah was a great king, but only 39 years later, uh, they were taken to Babylon. You know, 40 years isn't very long. It seems like it when you're quite young, but it's not very long, is it? I mean, I was already old 40 years ago, or at least my kids tell me that. And uh, Isaiah, it only took 39 years for this to happen. If, uh, if uh, uh, Usher's dates are about right, 
Uzziah, look at this genealogy. Uzziah was a good king. Jotham was a good king. His son was a good king. And we'll look at 2 Kings 15 and 16 as well. But uh, jo Jotham was a good king, but it says that they still had the, the groves and they still had idol worship, but he was a good king. He was a good son to his dad, but then his son Ahaz was a bad king. 2 Kings 16, in fact, we should read that. Go back to 2 Kings and you'll see much of the context here. In 2 Kings chapter 16, and read in particular verses 2 through 4, it says, But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? That means he threw his son into the flames. Can you imagine what it would take for some? That's not someone decent, but they do that uh, in respect to their religion, and it was something that he didn't want to leave. I don't understand that either. This is the kind of king that was the grandson to Uzziah, whose dad was um, uh, Jotham, who was a good king. And now Ahaz comes along, and it says he's a bad king. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, he made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. In other words, he was not only a bad king, he'd actually embraced the foolish practices of the idol worshipers that he hobnobbed with. It doesn't seem as though anything of his dad or granddad rubbed off on him. And I know we can't make our kids uh, trust the Lord. We know we can't do that, but we can certainly show them that we trust the Lord, and it makes a difference in our lives. And if it's important to us, it will be to our kids as well. We want to make sure that's the case. Well, these are going to be some allies that come up against Jerusalem. And the reason I find this very interesting is most of you can quote 714. This is the background of 714. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the prophecy about God himself. Emmanuel means God with us. God himself coming into this life and walking upon the streets of Jerusalem. This is the prophecy of that that we refer to over and over in the New Testament. We understand when we're looking at the prophecies of Jesus Christ. This is what brings us up to that when Jerusalem was being attacked by an alliance of two different nations. The north, which is a civil war, and, and then um, uh, uh, Samaria as well. So that's what, that's what this chapter is all about, and let's ask God to bless us tonight. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, and I thank you for the time I had to study, and Lord, I did stare at this a lot. I did try to make sure that I uh, understood this so that we could present this and show that you uh, never expect us to just jump out um, in a faith that... that uh, uh, is not understood, that it's not a good foundation. Father, you're giving this man who has turned his back upon you, embraced the abominations of the heathen, though he's the king over Jerusalem, uh, you have given him, you've offered him to give him a sign to make him understand that you will defeat these enemies. And Lord, that's the sign that's coming probably next week. But Lord, I sure thank you for that, Lord. My mind is raised to pray that you'd give me the right thoughts and the right words to speak. And more than anything else, may your spirit speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we pray that all the time. May God's spirit speak to your heart. Think about how much you enjoy the fact that we are led by the spirit of God in John 14 and 16 and those two chapters and, and many other places. Um, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God not only gives us comfort, but leads us into truth. There are passages you don't know, or there are uh, situations in this life you don't know what to do about, but when the Holy Spirit lives within you, you just patiently wait until He gives you the direction. Most people don't do that. Most people just jump out what looks like a good idea and beg God to fix it if it's not. Isn't that right? That's, that's what happens all too often. But the Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. Now, look at the problems, first of all, that come with compromise. The judges we look at on Sunday nights, it is one chapter after another of failures of the children of Israel. 
one chapter after another. Before they had a king, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They had the priesthood and all that, but one chapter after another shows their failures, and then God lifts them back up, and that's a blessing to us, isn't it? So just look at the compromise and what's behind the compromise of this man who should know better. They failed to address the idolatry that was in the land, and they hadn't finished running the Canaanites out, which we look at uh, in depth on, on Sunday nights. They'd failed to remove the high places. They'd failed to remove the high places, even under Jotham. They'd failed to remove the high places. They could have removed those. And yes, um, we wonder about that. That's like the presence of, uh, of cults in our midst. Well, this isn't Israel. It'd be nice not to have cults here. Doesn't it bother you? I, I go up to doors many times and I see uh, watchtowers on the doors that, that uh, I just soon weren't there. Okay, I'll leave it at that. But I'll see watchtowers and, and stuff like this. They peddle a false doctrine. They peddle a false one. So this was a good king, Jotham, his dad, but he didn't take away those things again. They did not rid the land of the distraction that was idolatry. Now, you look in our day today, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, we, that doesn't take a great deal of intellect to know you don't want in your life. There's a whole bunch of stuff. We don't want young people uh, looking at all kinds of foolishness on their phones. It's amazing now. Um, there's probably almost as many phones in here as there are people. Now, I know it's not quite that many, but in many rooms you go to, you see there's that many phones, don't you? And this phone is more powerful easily than just a few generations back of my computers. You can, I can call anywhere in the world with this phone, but I can get on the internet and young people can do that. It doesn't take much sense there, does it, to figure these things out. It doesn't take much sense to know what to avoid. It doesn't take much sense. I've seen so many people that, that skip church for a sporting event. I don't understand skipping church myself. I don't understand that. But there's a whole bunch of stuff we could apply this to, and they were just ignoring the clear commands of God uh, that were set forth in His Word way back in Deuteronomy chapter 7. But also, it is shown by example through the book of Judges, and then all the way through the historical books, the kings and so on, they failed to rid the land of the distractions. Now, Israel was a nation with one religion. They were a nation with one culture. In fact, in Ezra and Nehemiah, no, it's, it's Esther. It says uh, at that day when the Jews were able to fight back, many of the people became Jews. They converted not only to the religion of Israel, but to their culture as well. Well, what was, it, what was Israel doing? They were embracing the culture of the people that they were supposed to run, uh, run out of the land. They were embracing the culture and all, uh, apparently embracing their religion as well. It was always a, a trip up to them, uh, wasn't it? We looked at 2 Kings 16 about Ahaz's record where he even put his sons through the fire. I, I, that's just amazing to me. He put his sons through the fire. Now, roughly 700 years after all the failures of judges, the heathen are still allowed to stay. They still intermarried with them. They still suffered oppression. They still watched God deliver them over and over. And they had the record of good kings, whether it's Isaiah or Jotham. And now Ahaz comes along and has a different idea. What I am convinced is happening, I've probably said it before, in our culture today is that there is a concerted effort to get rid of the influence of the older generation. You know, it's funny, when, when uh, I think it's in Acts 15 when they had a, a council in Jerusalem, the ones that testified were the ones that had hazarded their lives for the gospel. You know, if you go out and you might uh, sacrifice your life to preach the gospel to people, you have maybe a little more seriousness that some people otherwise, otherwise wouldn't have. They're the ones, well, you look back at the greatest generation, I, that is World War II generation. I don't know, I don't know how many are left, but I've, had, I've known uh, men that were all the way back to the Spanish-American War. 
I've seen, I've talked to people like that because when I was a little kid in church, there was still one of maybe eight left. And he came into a church one time with, with his uniform on back in the 60s. But those were the guys that sacrificed for our country. They weren't all believers. I wish they were. But you know, when you look at what the founding principles of our country were, they understood what oppression was, in particular, religious oppression. And they tried to secure our freedom so that we had the freedom to worship God as we pleased. Well, somehow or other, they've lost the distinctiveness of the children of Israel and their covenants with God, and they allowed all these heathen to stay, and yet God returned them back and uh, defeated the foes and over and over delivered them, and they still wouldn't fix the problem. I trust some did. I trust some did. You can go into some pretty filthy areas and find a packet of people that really love the Lord, can't you? And that's a blessing still, but by and large, this was the problem. You know, it's interesting. Go back to 2 Kings 15, 2 Kings chapter 15, and it's a parallel to this, but 2 Kings chapter 15, and look at verse 37. 2 Kings 15, verse 37. In those days, the Lord began to send against Judah, Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. That's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? But you notice what it says? It says the Lord began to send against them, these kings. The Lord began to send them against the people of Israel, of, of Judah. It was God that started sending them, and God promised deliverance. Why? Some people just don't learn, and probably all of us are in that boat. We learn lessons a little more seriously when we pay something for it, don't we? And he's sending them in there. And remember, all of this was written for our learning. You ask yourself, why did all this happen? Well, it's God in his mercy one more time giving this bad king who had a pretty good lineage, a pretty good a couple of fathers, but this, this bad king giving him one more chance to see the mighty hand of God as compared to the, the, the impotent hand of the idol, idolaters. You see that one more time, and God sent them, didn't he? And in verses 2 and 3 of our text, it says, And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, which is Israel. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved, with the wind. I don't remember which preacher it was that was, uh, was accosted by someone with a gun. And he laughed at him, said, you can't threaten me with heaven. And I remember my friend, Buddy, Florence, did you ever know that? You knew the Hoffmans. I think it was Florence Hoffman. She was Curtis Hudson's secretary. That was my friend's mother. She was the one that would pray, God, in Buddy's hearing, God, every time Buddy does something wrong, would you let him get caught? He wanted to make, she wanted to make sure that her son heard that. And Buddy was, had suffered polio, and he said when he was knocking on doors in the downtown Chicago area, he said nothing, it was nothing to get a knife pulled on him. He said, that was not, he said, oh, you're not going to use that, just put that away. He'd, he'd have a knife pulled on him. He said, only a half a dozen times or so did someone pull a gun on him. And that's when he had particularly said, oh, put that away. You're not going to use that. You say, well, that's bold, isn't it? That's bold. When 9-11 happened, this guy that had a limp from polio, he decided no, one's in, no one is telling these people in the Middle East about Jesus and he just about lost his life going over there witnessing to people about Jesus. Right after 9-11, he took a bunch of people up to, to New York City and helped up there. Uh, that's someone who knows something about putting it all on the line for Jesus, isn't it? That's the older generation, isn't it? Well, it's become that now. But the ones that are dying off now are being replaced by kids who can't even figure out which bathroom to use. I took a... I had I was uh, annoyed by another one of those political uh, questionnaires. Asked me what race I, I was. I said that's uh, that's racist. And um, uh, I went through that and and I always look for a way to add 
my comments to this stuff because I know they're partisan. I know that. But they don't leave you a place to leave a comment on them. That's what I want to do is to leave a comment on those things. But it's all partisanship. And, and um, you learn some things down through the years when you've been around people like, like Andrea's neighbor, Joe. Tom and I met him years ago. Man, that was a long time ago. And he was a guard at Nuremberg. They took him off the front lines and put him in, at Nuremberg guarding Nazi war criminals. And they put him there for 10 hours. He said he'd stand there. I guess this is attention or something or at ease. And he'd look in this little window in the door and he watched all of the war criminals in there. And he got a signature of most of them on a dollar bill. And I've seen the dollar bill. Okay, If you look it up, you'll find a picture of it online. And Joe was, Joe was the kind of guy that lied about his age to go fight in World War II because he was a big kid. And he fought in World War II, and he had great ideas. I'm sure Andrea could uh, fill me in even more. He had great ideas, and uh, he, he was opinionated and so on. But the people that have fought for our country have different ideas about our country than the kiddies in our country today, don't they? And it's the same with those that have hazarded their lives for the gospel, that have hazarded their lives for the gospel. They have a different opinion about that stuff. It's not hoping, coping, caring, and sharing, because that doesn't save anyone. What saves people is realizing you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And the day you trusted Christ as Savior was the best day in your life. Well, this is about 700 years after the failings of the judges. And though they were allowed to stay, this all happened to them because God sent them. And they were weakened because their conviction, they knew they weren't where they should be. Just think about it. If you were thrust into a pretty serious situation, what would, what would be the weakness of your heart? It would be the stuff that you know you haven't done that God's told you to do. When we'd go knocking on doors in California, um, I just learned that if you saw a whole tailgate party in maybe the wrong side of the railroad tracks, Pick the biggest guy and go out there and talk to him. Because honestly, they're more afraid of the gospel than you are of them. It usually made my partner nervous. I thought, I'd just stay in the truck, and I'd go out and do that. And I'm still alive, I think, okay? Um, you have to make sure that your heart's right with God, shouldn't you? When your life's maybe on the line, it's going to bring some thoughts to your heart. Why else would he, with the prophet Isaiah telling him these things, why else would his heart be moved? And later on, uh, we plainly see that he doesn't want a sign. He doesn't, wa he doesn't want God to confirm all of this because he's fully determined to continue on in his idolatrous worship. There are all kinds of people like that today, aren't there? He was weakened because he had ignored the conviction of God on his life. Fear produces a pretense, not conviction. And some of the commentaries I read, they said this was the most phony guy you'll see. He was just a hypocrite. He said one thing while his heart was in a different place. Weakness is ultimately the problem of compromise, isn't it? But look what God does in his mercy. In verse 3, then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. Now, we saw from 2 Kings that God moved these two <coughs> kings to bring their armies up toward Jerusalem. <coughs> but now he says, okay, to, to Isaiah, go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool and the highway of the fuller's field. All those things are really a mouthful. You go and meet them. You go and see them. He sent them out. His name means the remnant shall return. Now, isn't that amazing? The remnant shall return. That's his son, Sheer, Sheer Jashub. Um, and they were sent to the end of the conduit. What does a conduit do? It conducts water. This, a city that is, uh, their, their objective was to uh, um, 
ambush and circle the city and starve them out. And that's why they had a water conduit bringing life-giving water to them. And, and God tells Isaiah to go up there and speak to them at the place where the water comes into the city. And you can see all over that that God always shows that, uh, that water of life comes from him. And Jesus, of course, is the water of life. There's all kinds of imagery here. Uh, go at the end of the con uh, conduit. It's a place of the refreshing of water. And not only that, not only that, it says at the upper pool. At the upper pool. In other words, go to a high place at the upper pool. That's where you're to meet. You have a vision of everything around you. You're in a place where life-giving water is there. And you're talking to a king that's scared, who loves his idolatry more than he loves to hear from God. And it's the, high, the highway of the fuller's field. The fuller's field is where they would wash their clothes and lay them out to dry. In other words, a place of cleanliness. It takes, in the New Testament, we see it plainly, the washing of the water of the Word. It takes, um, it takes the Word of God, which is the living Word of God and the water of life and all of these things. And, and uh, there's still the promise with his, the name of His Son that there's going to be a remnant that's remaining. The remnant is throughout the Bible, isn't it? Because God is not finished with Israel. And the mistake of so many modern theologies today is you cannot tell the difference between Israel and the church, and they are completely different. They're different. And most of the Bible is toward Israel. Think about it. Most of the Bible... The New Testament starts at the death of Jesus Christ. Hebrews says you can't have a testament until the death of the testator. Jesus died at the end of the Gospels. He rose again, and the mark of the church is the indwelling Holy Spirit. That, start, that means that this starts at the book of Acts. It starts at the book of Acts. And so all of these things would be sending a message to the children of Israel, wouldn't it? It's the highway of the fuller's field, but the Bible tells us that the wise man departs from evil. Hey, the solution to his fear is to get your heart right before God. Hey, that doesn't mean the problem's gone. It just means, well, you can't threaten me with heaven. Isn't that right? And this king is leading a people that are in as bad a shape as he is because He's done nothing to restrain them. He's not been a good spiritual leader, has he? Well, all of this is going to set up the sign in chapter 7, verse 14. But this, you can plainly see, um, is the provision of God's counsel to this man. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, about the Holy Spirit is Jesus said to the disciples, this is in John 14, 15, 16, he said, I must go away. For if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come and indwell you. You ever read that and realize what that means? That means it'd be wonderful to have Jesus Christ standing here, wouldn't it? Man, it'd be wonderful. I'd have a million questions for him. But he said, it's better for me to go away that the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. So you're not subject to having me bodily there. The Spirit of God is indwelling you. That's just one of the wonderful truths of the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells us, comforts us. That's what you probably need much of the time. He directs our steps. That's what you need often. He um, leads us into all truth. And all of those things is a mark of the indwelling Spirit is that He leads us. You look back on your life and you see how God has led you along. How God has led you. Number three, look at verse four. It's the promise of protection. Say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, because he was fearful. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason was Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Now think about this. I think I cited it the other day. What was Mike Tyson's... Um, attitude toward his opponents when he got into the ring. Remember what I said? He wanted to kill them. Now, I remember watching Tyson, because I lived in Arizona at the time, and he was just a 20-year-old kid. And a lot of his fights would last, oh, less than 60 seconds. 
and he just swarmed over the other guy, and he was angry, and they, they said, well, that's terrible. He says, well, I was a different man then. Now, I don't know what all of his testimony is. I don't know that. But fierce anger is what is characterizing these two kings that want to come against Jerusalem, and God's servant is saying, don't be afraid of him. Now, that would be a blessing, wouldn't it? Don't be afraid of him. When God says not to be afraid, you don't have to be afraid, do you? But you have to accept that truth, too. So it's a promise of protection from this evil alliance. Both Syria and Israel had fought and not prevailed, but now they allied themselves together. In verse 5, it says, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. So they take the counsel of evil against them. They want to do what's evil to Jerusalem, and they're, they're going to surround Jerusalem and try to defeat Jerusalem. So they want to usurp David's throne. Verse 6, let us go up against Judah and vex it. That is, weary them with a siege. And let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. In other words, they wanted to usurp David's throne. They wanted to usurp David's throne, and that has been uh, an over, uh, over and over, that's been the objective of the devil and his crowd, to usurp. Why do you suppose that the devil wanted to kill Jesus before the cross? Why did he want to get him to worship him? He wants to defeat the promises to David uh, that Messiah, his son, would sit on that throne. So, um, so, uh, the promise of protection is wonderful to, uh, against the usurpation of his throne. And verse 7, thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand. It doesn't matter how evil and how vexatious, how much, how strong their uh, counsel is against Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Now, one more time, remember this. These are people that as a whole have ignored the commands of God, and their history is that they ignore the commands of God. They've had good kings that tried to lead them in the right direction, and they um, ignored the, uh, the kings. As soon as the king was gone, they started going into idolatry or maybe become more obvious then. They didn't have a good attitude, a, a good record. I read in, in Acts chapter 7 today, and, and uh, Stephen goes through and mentions Hebrew history all the way through. And what is it? It's all negative. They always turn their back on God. And it always strikes me when it says, just like your fathers, you've, um, uh, you've hardened your hearts. You know what I always tell, especially young people when I'm preaching to them, when God speaks to your heart, make sure you respond. You know why? Because when God makes it plain that he wants you to make a decision, if you don't, it's easier next time to say no once again. And before long, it's almost as if God leaves you alone. Well, you don't want that. You don't want that. Think of all the decisions that are critical for young people today that are coming up. All the critical decisions... Young people, what do you do when you get out of high school? What do you do when it comes to finding a mate? What do you do when uh, you determine what you're going to do with your life? Where are you going to find to serve God? Because I recommend everyone serve God. And there are decisions to be made. And with those decisions, there's response sometimes to heartache. Isn't there? Where are you going to find your comfort? Where are you going to find your direction? And yes, our parents are a great example. We want our parents, to, we as parents want to be that. But they're called to a decision here. And God lays it out through the prophet. And, he, and this king makes excuses. He doesn't even want to see a, a, a sign to verify that it's God speaking. That's a sad place to be, isn't it? Um, they failed. Now, it's funny in verse 8, it says, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. 
And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. In other words, in 65 years, they're going to be deported anyway. These ones that are coming against them in just 65 years, they're going to be deported. And if you want to see where that happens, look at 2 Kings 15 once again. 2 Kings chapter 15. They're going to be deported. 2 Kings 15. Isn't it wonderful how the Bible all fits together? And what I like is that like the name of, uh, what is it, the name of one of the, now I lost it, but I think the name of one of the uh, uh, magicians in Egypt is given in the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? It's not in the Old Testament, but we get that name in the New Testament. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 29, it says, it says, uh, And the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon, and abel and Genoa, and Kedesh. I keep finding these verses with these names in them. And... Um, um, and Kedesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. Now, this king was scared of this guy that wanting to come and take uh, surround Jerusalem, but he doesn't want God to give him the sign. He doesn't want to stand in God's strength. He doesn't want to surrender to God. And so what happens? In just 65 years, though, he's gone. 65 years, that nation is already going to destruction. It's promised it's already promised. And then in 17, verses 1 through 6, in the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, that's the king we're talking about, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. Again, in 65 years, they're going to be taken uh, captive anyway to the ones they're trying to ally themselves with. And this king still doesn't want to surrender to God. Isn't that an amazing thing? As you read your Bible, you find more and more how profound and how simply profound Proverbs 4.23 is. Keep your heart with all diligence. For men are the issues of life. That means you ride herd on your heart. One of the horses we had uh, when I was at the camp, there were two full brothers. They were both retired racehorses, so they were a lot of fun to ride. And a racehorse doesn't like another horse in front of it. And they were two horses, and I wasn't really a great rider. I could, I, my, my objective was not to embarrass myself too bad, okay? One of them was rusty. That's the one I usually rode. And he was like riding a jackhammer. The other one was his full brother, uh, Arrowhead. I called him Airhead. Okay, and Airhead was like riding your couch. I don't know how they could be full brothers. One was so smooth to ride, but he was an Airhead because if he even suspected that you weren't in charge, he'd find a low branch for you at speed. If, if he felt like it, he'd try to turn around and go back to the barn. And these poor kings... These poor kings didn't figure out that they had the responsibility to establish some things that, uh, that would help the people under them. Um, these uh, bad kings were taken captive, weren't they? And uh, this is all reiterated in Ezra as well. So the promise of protection was ignored and they failed. And then, um, let's see. Verse 11, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. It was laid out plainly for this king. And this king was nervous. His heart was moved in verse 2. He was offered a, um, a sign, which we won't have time to go into tonight. But he wouldn't take the sign, but it plainly says, if you will not believe, Surely you will not be established. What's wonderful is God wants to establish your life on a firm foundation. And isn't it wonderful that God gives us a book here that 
they didn't really have uh, personally as you and I have them today. In many of the years, in the last 2,000 years, they were not readily available, and probably every one of our homes has more than half a dozen of these Bibles. I probably have more than a dozen in my own desk, not counting the ones that are false ones. Okay? Why, why would these people not just surrender to the Word of God and build their life on that firm foundation? Hey, it's wonderful. I, I, you think about uh, Samuel when God spoke to him. And Eli knew God well enough to know after, eventually, Samuel, that's God trying to speak to you. Speak, Lord, thy servant hears. I like that spirit. God, speak to my heart. When you go to church, God, speak to my heart. And when you get in the habit early as a, as a youth, man, that serves you well as you grow older, doesn't it? As you grow older. And <clears throat> I guess we're at the age where we reminisce now. And it's so nice to see people that I went to college with that are still preaching the same old gospel. You know, that's a blessing. 50 years later, they're still doing it. Oh, they may not be able to take as big of a, of a bite of the uh, schedule as they used to. They're still preaching the same gospel. They have kids that are preaching the same gospel. Um, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. And there were kings that died not even being missed, weren't there? There's one in particular. He wasn't even missed when he died. That's a sad thing about a king, isn't it? Because he didn't build his life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Today, you're almost laughed at if you don't build if you build your life on the on Jesus Christ. I don't mind that. Why? By their fruits you shall know them. There's a whole bunch of stuff I don't have to worry about. Isn't there? But this king was such a bad king, he didn't, even, he didn't want to lead his people. He didn't want to have it verified that God was speaking through Isaiah to him. And he goes down in history as a bad king that did nothing right. Isn't that sad? And yet, as a preview, all of this, because he doesn't want a, a sign, all of this leads to verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. He didn't want a sign. That's the context of the sign that is cited even in the book of Matthew, when, uh, that uh, this is God with us. Jesus Christ is the Savior. That is the sign that, and what brought that about. This man that didn't want to have a sign, God says, okay, I'm going to give you a sign. This is going to be the sign. A virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. If you heard that, you'd kind of wonder about that, wouldn't you? But that's a sign. That's what makes it different, isn't it? So next week, Lord willing, we'll finish the intro to verse 14, but it all adds together. It all comes together with a king that's reluctant to surrender to God. Very, very sad. Let's pray.